Welcome to this one-to-one. -one. I'm Peter Martin and I'm delighted to say, uh, well, I don't want to use the word hero, but certainly in a musical sense, uh, our special guest is Horse. Uh, Horse McDonald, welcome uh, to the programme. Uh, it's great to chat to you and great to talk about an album that means so much to me when I was growing up. It's one of the albums that I put in a category of there's not a duff song on it for me. Now, that's rare. I'm, I'm taken aback because it, I think that's just wonderful to hear and because sometimes unless you've got a continual sort of reference to it or uh, people saying to you on a regular basis, you kind of forget how important something is to someone else when it's very important to yourself. Yeah, well, I mean, when I looked at the same sky and I think to myself, at the time I remember thinking, here's a talented singer. I saw the first video on Channel 4 and I thought, this is, it's different. Um, the fact then, I don't know about Scottish people, but when I actually started to do a bit of research and I thought, Scottish, Lanarkshire, from our area, and I thought, absolutely brilliant. Now, that for me was the click to think, I want more of your songs. Um, was that album really the heart and soul of you from childhood all the way through to the point you've got the deal and you've got it in your hands? I think like everybody, um, it's a massive and a long journey to get to that actual point. Um, and so many different things, it's a bit like being in a dodge and things knock you a different direction, move you that way. You meet different people, you try different producers. Um, my own life curve mixed with everybody else's um, journeys to get to that point. And they do say that that's why the ne next album that people make is a hard one because you've bundled everything together and it all goes into that. And that album in itself, my own personal journey to get to it, very, very um, difficult teenage years. Um, and, but singing was my way of exiting it and, and looking after myself. I go and sing in my back bedroom um, and I began writing songs. And that's, that's my development. And um, so you then get publishing deal if you're lucky um, and then you get your record deal and then the next part is recording it. And the actual journey of the recording in itself is also um, a learning curve because our demos were pretty shitty, really. <laughs> you know, I mean, we didn't know what the hell we were doing. It's, I mean, kids today are flying spaceships, you know, and like Angela and I, for example, Angela, co-writer, we just discovered the wheel. You know, and these other kids, the comparison with today's kids with technology, you know, they're flying spaceships. And, and we were just, oh, right, okay, hey, la, 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 you know. Um, but as you said, the songs were there. Um, I'm a bit like Elton John to her, Bernie Taupin. Yeah. You know, she was a, she was a stunning lyricist. And we, we it, there was a kind of osmosis in her writing. So I would have lots of rough ideas on my cassette tape um, and I would, she'd listen through and she'd go, hmm, yeah, give me this one, that one, this one, that one, and she'd take them away. And I'd be like, oh, okay. And they'd come back, um, and it's almost, I can't, I can't think of another analogy other than, you know, I hand her a, a, a dark-haired baby and I'd get a ginger-haired baby <laughs> back and I'd, I'd have to re-ingest the song. And then it was back to being coming out of me. I can't describe it any better than that. And, and... So the, so the basic songs, even though the, the demos were rubbish, you know, um, the basic song was there. And um, I, I always say that to people that in a lot of what happens in music today, um, people forget the, the, a basic song is a melody and a lyric. And it doesn't matter what bus it goes on, you know, the song has to be good. Uh, things have changed so much. We can talk about that maybe in a little while, but... Um, at one point, I was summoned after signing the record deal. I was summoned to London to see the MD Simon Potts, um, and he was like, "Are you going to play us some of the new stuff?" And we we were on little port studios making songs up. And you're like, oh, "God!" And I had to go down, um, and it was a big room. He'd like long flowing blonde locks, and he was like, "All right, host, what you got?" You know, and and I'd play the stuff. And but the whole reason he had me down there, he said, "I want you to get rid of the band." And I was like, oh. and that was one of those moments, um, sliding doors, you know, um, we want you to get rid of the band. Uh -huh. I only signed the, you to, I only signed the record deal to get your voice. He was the person that signed uh, Mick Hucknall. Yeah. 
and simply read is like that. Yeah, absolutely. It's a kind of bought in band, however he does tend to use the same musicians. So for me, I, I was, I was, I was, I didn't know what to do. Um, my instinct was no. Yep. Um, because I had loyalty to Angela and to the players we had at the time, and I stuck with it. But me now, I'm like, oh, I wonder what happened. <laughs> you yeah. know, when a Gwyneth Paltrow sliding doors away. <laughs> um, but I, I, when I, I, you know, with with um, logic and and um, sensible thought, each musician put in something of themselves, yes, which gave you the very individual sound of that album, and it's 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 not what you call Scottish. Um, you can't tell where I come from with my singing, no. um, but it's not Scottish per se. But it is Scottish. Yeah. It's very unique, and it's a, it's a, the amalgamation of. Everyone, who they are, what what they've inputted, and it would not have been the same yeah. if we'd had session musicians. They tried to put us in with session musicians, yeah, and it just was like bland, you know. Do you think your Scottish values and your upbringing maybe allowed you to hold firm and make that decision? Totally, totally. I was I was nervous and worried, and I never told the band. I never told Angela. I just stuck to my guns. I'm glad you said the content is king. Because, you know, whatever field I work in, I always say to people, it doesn't matter how much technology I add to this. If the core product's rubbish, it's rubbish. Uh -huh. So, you know, I look at it and I say to myself, you're right, I didn't think about it as Scottish. I'm going to say something that's going to take us into a, a part of your life that I think is very meaningful to you. And certainly you've been a pioneer for it. But when I looked at horse and I know there was a period where people were trying to work out who you were, or uh, indeed, rather, uh, I think, uh, derogatory, what you were. Um, I looked at Horst and I thought, this is a talented singer. Mm -hmm. That was probably because of the people that I grew up with. I grew up in an environment where I didn't, I didn't put people in boxes. I just thought, there's a talented singer. I love the way she looks. Mm -hmm. She's slightly different, but the songs were the driving force. I think one of the biggest issues we had, and I didn't know who I was. I, I mean, in saying that, you'd think I was a teenager. I, we signed the first record deal when I was 29. Wow. It's Katie Tunstall signed her first record deal when she was 29. These days, no one signs a record deal, <laughs> um, but certainly not at that age group. But at that point, you're starting to kind of mature as people. In me, I hadn't a clue who I was uh, or what I wanted. And then you end up in uh, the music industry and you need to have a really, really strong pair of um, uh, <laughs> nerves. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because, um, because you know, they get um, stylists, all of these different things. But I wasn't sort of very um, structured with them. I needed help and support. There was no KD Lang. Um, there was Jimmy Somerville, yeah. um, who didn't... Um, Things were hard for him. Um, I'm obviously talking about gender and sexuality. Um, and it was a very, very difficult time. And I think being open... I couldn't be anything but myself, Peter, because yeah. I look the way I do. I dress the way I do. Um, I couldn't... I, I always say I, ne I could never not be myself. But the problem for the record industry, for people generally, you need to belong in a box... Yeah. And there was no excuse the phrase a horse box. Um, so I just had to keep ploughing my lonely furrow. Sadly for me, um, the record company, I mean, I, I could have been dynamite. It could have been a massive moment, which happened later with KD Lang. Um, and I think when KD Lang came along, there was that big explosive moment, oh, we've never had one of you before. Yeah. And and then because we were already there um, as a unit, as a band, with me as the singer, the front person, um, it was like when we were trying to do interviews, et cetera, there was already that controversy taken away and and like, oh, okay, like you were second along the line. Yeah. Um, uh, and But... The bottom line for me and us was about the music. Yeah. Can I ask you two quick questions yeah. on that? And one of them is a, a little jump, but the first one is directly to what you're saying. Do you think that because 
people want to put you in a box, do you think that was detrimental to your overall success, which I feel should have taken you onto a level of a, of a simple minds around that time? Oh, yeah, because totally. I thought the music was, you know, really strong and, and different. It's a double-edged sword because we didn't particularly belong in any box. And so we didn't we weren't part of the postcard, you know, group of people. We weren't part of um uh, teenage, uh, you know, that whole, we weren't part of that crowd. We were around at the same time as Deacon Blue, yep. Hue and Cry, um, Love and Money. Um, God, teenage fan club, I'm trying to think of the name. Um, you know, yeah. we were around at the same sort of time. Joe McAlinden, yeah, another Joe boy. Joe McAlinden, I keep yeah. in touch with Joey's away up. He's a great lad. What a voice. Yeah, absolutely. You know, but someone else who's like, similar to myself, that there are people... And um, we'll talk about, you know, how amazing Superstar were and how amazing he is. But there was the tipping point didn't happen. And when your tipping point doesn't happen, it all falls away very quickly. And in the days of like the late 80s, there was a, if you had your tipping point, off you'd go around the board, Monopoly board, uh, you know, and every single act from that kind of time, you know, like... Um, uh, <laughs> Annie Lennox, yeah. uh, Sweet Dreams, that sort of moment in time. Now, they were the tourists before that, and they were fantastic. Um, but the lifespan is was, a, at that time, about five years. Yeah. So you would always peak, and you'd always disappear. Nowadays, you're lucky if you get six months to a year. And, and you're gone. Our, and you're gone. Whereas for me, um, and I'm moving slightly away from what, we were, what you asked, but for me, I've been doing this over 40 years. And I'm, I'm in the make, middle of making my next album. And the songs, to me, are better than ever. And uh, I feel, I know what I'm doing now. I'm yeah. ready. And I feel, in a strange way, that I'm at the same point I was at 30 years ago. Well, bleep, bleep, 32. We've missed two years somewhere yeah. along the line with the COVID thing. Um, so I've, I feel like I'm at almost at the same sort of point. It's a tipping point for me, a, a stepping off point. And now I will not be so reticent of saying, this is what I want. This is who I am. There were never enough opportunities for us because no matter what position you're in at a record label, you sign a major deal, but you, you, there's a pecking order within that. Yeah. And uh, we had a management company, laterally we had a management company that looked after um, Prince, Sinead, Seal, uh, CRF they were called, Cavallo, Ruffalo, Fagnoli. And we had one of the guys that was beneath that. So our pecking order in that company was there. In the record company, our pecking order was down here. So um, it just really affects how much you're going to get. Yeah, but but the songs were so strong. So what what happened? What was their attitude? Provide, of course, they can't. They want to box you in somewhere. But you have the speed of the beat of my heart. You Could Be Forgiven for me was the one that really just, so I thought it was magnificent. And then, of course, everybody... What I think everybody's obsessed with the... I mean, it's a classic, careful. It's such a brilliant song. You know, I'm, I want to talk to you about how it came about yeah. and what it means to you. But but the other ones, you know, there's there's pace, there's a catch, there's that... There's a, I so call them, them Paul McCartney. If there's a great melody and a catch and a hook, you're there. Well, we all, I always call it the, the money shot. It's like <laughs> it's like when I've been playing the new songs to people, I'm going, and, and you think this bit's going, oh, yeah. and then, now, here we go, here we go. And, and I know all about chorus and lifts, and all of it's not all about the effects of the music. It's within the melody. Yeah. So something like the next album, God's Home Movie, if I take that as an example, it's like... Um, uh, God's Home Movie is the chords only change twice in that yeah. but it's the same chords going round da, 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 uh -huh. da, 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 da. and when you get to the chorus it's the same chords what happens is the melody changes yeah. ah, da, 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 da. you know so yeah. it's like people are like oh it lifts and it's a natural lift I think people who write today it's a lot of they, they learn a lot from algorithms Oh, and this is what people like. Um, we'll feed this information into a computer and it'll tell us what we like. Yeah. But when you get writers like myself and other very good writers, it comes from um, a natural um, way of creating stuff, like a great artist, you yeah. know, painter. But if, but if this is album 11 and you're telling me that this is, you know, a, a collection of songs that is the best, you, you, you know, you've done, um, I'm not saying a long while because mm. each one takes you on a journey, but if it's the best work you've done, 
is it going to be more difficult because the only people really that you're you're selling to in that market are the people who've come on the journey with you? Well, that is a good point because it's a, I'm exactly at that that um, I'm diving off a, a board at the moment because I'm going to put a single out to go with our tour next year and it's a new song. Um, it's dynamite. I, I can't tell you anymore than that. Yeah. I can't show you or play it at the moment. I mean, it's mixed, it's finished. I'm looking at doing a video as well. I can only do so much myself. I look after myself. I've got no assistants. I've got no people. I won't let, excuse the pun again, I won't let go of the reins because I've done it before. Yeah. It doesn't get me anywhere. I need to get that on the radio. But what about the gloss? What about the what about the the sparkly bit that you said was added to the same sky thirty years ago? Do you need that now, or are you able to add that? The people, I, um, the players I'm working with. I was working with a producer called Jamie Smith up in a, a, a little old church in Fasnacloy called uh, St Mary Space, um, and I spent ten days with him, and I took very rough things up there, and and between us. That he said to me at the start, "What do you want to try and achieve?" And I said, "I love Bond. I love, uh, I love film music, yeah. um, and uh, you know those soaring choruses." And and we spoke about the elements, and off we went. And and the thing is, the thing about Go uh, Same Sky, I love the album. Yeah, I love the single. The excitement, the excitement of sitting, knowing you're going on Radio One. I remember sitting in my flat in Garnet Street, sitting there going. <gasps> Oh, just waiting for the record to be played. <laughs> and when it played, you just sit there going, oh, oh, oh. you can't explain that to someone. I don't know if there's a, f a comparison in other fields, um, like, you know, di swimming, diving into the water, um, playing a game of football, yeah. scoring a goal. I, I don't know, there must be similar uh, things, but for, to hear your record on the radio at that level for the first time is just mind-blowing. Well, hearing it is one thing. When you were recording it and you you heard the finished product, or when you'd written a song, was there a moment where you thought, when you were putting the same sky together, oh, wait a minute, this song has got it? Oh, all of them. <laughs> Did you feel that for all, all of them? All of them, oh yeah. God. They, they're I'm all like your children. That. It's like they're your children. Yeah. There, there was one, there's one that I absolutely hate the start. Can I can I can I suggest to you yeah. what it is? Yeah. Right, and I, 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 it's the only one where I don't like the start. God, if it's not this one, it will I'm, be. I'm in uh, big no, trouble. It will be. Uh, don't call me at the start of it. Yes. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah. But it was not the start. It was nothing to do with us. It was the producer. You know that the the the, the, the um, producers try to get some PPL payments by being part of the recording. So. Um, I'm trying to think. Simon Cowell, who's got no musical talent at all, is credited on every single record because he's gone in and he's hit a triangle or something. He's credited. He gets a credit for every... Anyway, so, so producer Pete Smith was like, I'm going to make some backing vocals. I can see this starting out. Don't, don't, don't. And I was like, oh, my God. And, I, was, and I, I, I didn't want it. Yeah, I'm so glad I got that right. It's the only thing that grates with me. Do you know but, what we do live though? Yeah. Well, I don't want to spoil this for us, but, <laughs> but because I'm playing the album in order on tour, yep. it, they, they just give me the notes and I go, do you do everything I ask you to? <laughs> and off we go and we forget that nonsense. Yes. And that, it comes in as a backing vocal and it makes sense within the song. Yeah. But not like, hello. And that was that's the head instead of the heart. Yeah. The producer going, let's put that at the top because that's catchy. And you're like, no. And we fought them, but we didn't win. So I'm glad you agree. Yeah. It's, it's, and, but when we do it live, it's goodbye. <laughs> yeah. How difficult um, was it to become Horse, the talented singer, uh, and, you know, focus on that? And then suddenly, something that I, in the first ever concert, long before I ever got to know you, in the first concert that I went to, um, it might have been the Queen's Hall, I'm not sure, I sat in the audience and, and I got a strong sense of, by the way, I'm out. Mm -hmm. I haven't I haven't made a big announcement anywhere. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm a lesbian. Um, and, you know, there was people in the audience cheering because clearly they'd never <laughs> heard anybody fight the fight. How difficult was it for you to be looked upon as a, a serious artist, but you're also actually somehow trying to change people's mentality? Mm -hmm. Stupidity for me, but... I think... I think um... There's, um, I think the Americans talk about it being your authentic self. 
and I think all I've ever tried to do along the, the way, along my journey, is be myself. So I've been looking for myself and using my voice, whether it's singing or speaking, people have empathy with that. Yes. And I'm, it doesn't matter what, what gender you are, sexuality, race, it's a human thing of, of having your voice um, and being yourself. And I discovered over the years, instead of like hiding behind my guitar and snarling at people, yeah. I actually walk out into the, and I tend to be very open to the audience. And it's, I, that's, going to, that's like, a, I'm trying to sort of bring it around to some religious connection, but it's almost like a, an, an iconic kind of, I've nothing to hide. I have nothing to hide. I'm just being myself. And I think people um, are inspired by that or um, have empathy because they understand what it's like to try and be yourself. And when they see someone that's being open, yeah, it's there's, there's nothing to attack or nothing to, you know, uh, go for. And, and, and it's the antithesis of how I was growing up, the fear of um, discovery, the fear of being attacked, because I was attacked as I grew up. Um, and mainly, actually, when I was like 15, 16, gangs, little boys of, you know, 12, 13. Um, and I don't think that children actually are born, well, they're not. They're not born with the hatred. Yeah. They learn the hatred. It's the same, obviously, with, with football, yeah. you know, sectarianism and, and race and um, uh, religion. Uh, it, they, no one is born with that. They learn it. I believe you're a product of your parents and the people that are around your circle. With that in mind, how was your family in your, in your battle with your talent that you undoubtedly had? Um, I know that sometimes, you know, you, you, it's not arrogance to say that you're special. Um, you know you've got something, but how was the battle between talent and your family coming to terms I'm with laughing, you? I'm laughing because like my dad was like, he loved opera. <laughs> He loved opera and um, uh, classical music. And my mum wasn't even allowed to have the radio on in the background or, unless it was something like that. And he would play Beethoven and, and things like that. Or I did listen to um, um, people like Jose Carreras, whose voice I absolutely adore. Um, so I, I learned that I had a real mishmash of um, uh, different things going on in the house, the stuff I would listen to um, and the rest of the stuff that was going on. I think there was a point where um, I was just working away at it. I just kept going at it and my dad was just like, oh, that's sort of, you know. And I also remember being in my back bedroom singing my songs and hearing the, the, the step creak. And, 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 I, and I'd be like, and I'd, I'd be like that. And I'd think, no, and I'd carry on. I'd hear it creak again. And it'd be my, I'd not be my mum. <laughs> my mum coming up the stairs to have a wee listen and I'd go, go away! You know, like Kevin, you know, the <laughs> angry teenager, go away. But, you know, you know, as time wore on, uh, they knew nothing about what was going on for me in the town. And my dad was quite, uh, my dad was the Burris of Air of the town. Yeah. He was quite an important person. And so the, the double-edged, again, the double thing for me was um, not to bring shame in the family. It's a really difficult um, uh, path to, to be on. But... Uh, I did. I put the Scottish Chamber Orchestra in the bars, um, and I, it's now an album called Both Sides. You plug there. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, I invited my dad and his brother that he hadn't known about, who was adopted out when he was a wee boy. Um, he brought him. He'd he'd uh, got in touch with the agency and got in touch with the two brothers, and so my dad came with his brother to the Scottish Chamber Orchestra. My mum was there too. Um, and when I think they're both gone now, um, and when I think about, and when I listen to that recording, they are both in that hall with me singing and, and proud as punch. From that point, my dad was always going, your mum's number one fan and I'm number two. <laughs> but it's, a, it's an amazing thing because people often say, you know, has there been influence in your family, any other singers? And my dad sang a little bit, you yeah. know, amateur, uh, did amateur dramatics, blah, blah. Um, but the uncle I'm talking about, who's called Walter, um, he uh, came into the family and I discovered he sang for Scottish Opera. Wow. <laughs> so it's in the family. What about the, the what about the sexuality part of it, though? Was your friends and your... In a way, 
in our family, we tend to put that shield round, yeah. you know, and you, you know, you, you kind of a try and protect people from, as you say, if you're getting people out with that, yes. who are having a go at you because they don't see you as their normal. I think, I think, I think a lot of families in that period of time they would do that. Um, they wouldn't want to talk about it, but they would wouldn't hear anything about some against someone. But I was even more insular within my own family. I talked to my younger brother actually um, in my late teens about things, but I never really talked to them uh, when I was growing up. Yeah. I didn't want to bring shame in the family, and. Um, and then we had our deals, all of that stuff. I did the most ridiculous interview with the News of the World at one point, and it was a journalist I trusted, and I very stupidly... I have, I've always talked openly. Yeah. It was a very daft thing to do, uh, because what I said was... I mean, I can I say this freely now, you know? If Lanark was in the um, heart of the south, southern states of America, the Ku Klux Klan would be rife. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. It's true. And it, it could be Lanark, it could be Motherwell, it yeah. could be Orkney. It, it was that small town mentality that if someone's different, you know, then they're up for, let's, let's target you. Um, red hair, you know, big ears, sticky out ears. Um, and I'd said this, but anyway, there was this big thing in Lanark about... Oh dear, who does she think she is? <laughs> but, yeah. but then I did move back, funnily enough. But my dad said to me, I talked about all the stuff that had happened to me in Lanark and being chased by people and the police. I couldn't even trust the police because I, you've seen the play. I think um, there was once I was going to meet my mum at the hospital where she worked and I walked past a police patrol car and there was two cops in it and the, the bloke in the driver's side of the window was down. And as I walked past, he went, oh, how much swearing can we use in this? <laughs> Oh no, you're fine. All right, <laughs> there's that fucking lazy. Wow. And I was like, <gasps> and I would have been sixteen or something, and I thought, oh my god, I can't, I can't, I, I'm not safe. Yeah. If this is what the police think, now it might be just one person, but we know what that whole um, institution is like, or would have been like. And I glanced. There was a girl, young woman, in the car with him, and it was someone I would have been at school with, and I thought, oh no. I, I can't live here anymore. Yeah. And as soon as I could, I, I left. But my dad said to me, when he, he hadn't spoken to the family, when my dad saw that, he said he went to the chief inspector and he said, this could never happen to anyone else. Do you think now it's... society has moved on or have gone backwards? Ooh, that's a hard one. I, I think it's, it's moved on quite a lot. Um, Something strange has happened in lockdown. I don't know what, I'm no expert, but I feel there's a lot of hatred around, an awful lot of hatred. And there's, it's, there's religious hatred, there's um, racial hatred, there's homophobia rising, there's, um, there's um, uh, is it xenophobia? There's, yeah. there's all of these, these phobias just seem to have risen. Now, it's, it's, it's funny, I, I treat people as I find them. Yeah. So um, I'm finding that what's happening to the transgender community is a bit like what happened to me when I was growing up. Um, I, and I thought that people were kind of open, more open. And, and it, it seems to me that there's this huge explosion of hatred and it's not just at one specific thing. And, and I think it's quite, it's quite frightening. Yeah, absolutely. Um... I, and I'm trying to get into your psychology of the album now. Um, I know from working at that time when that album was out, I was going down to Manchester, London, and I was telling my mates, you got to gotta listen, listen to this. You, yeah. you, listen to this. You got to listen to this album. And I know that you were slightly peeved by the fact that you know a lot of the sales were taken off because you were. Uh, it you, was you're called, in it was Scotland. weighted. Yeah. It was weighted. There was a, now the thing is, it must have happened to other artists. Yeah. I mean, I've spoken to James Grant as well because he assumed I'd been on top of the pops and we, you know, had a top whatever. And I said, no, we were always just outside. Yeah, and of course, remember that a lot of record companies would go to specific areas which were being monitored as part of the charts. I mean, honestly, I used to have a mate of mine that he loved the jam, and I said, I've never met a, a record company that absolutely markets that band to the point to get them to number one. No. You know, if it's not free T-shirts with the single at the time, no, yeah. you used to have everything yeah. to try yeah. and get people to get yeah. it. I saw, <laughs> interestingly, very recently within the last few months, I saw someone came up on my timeline on my horse Facebook page and she said, 
Oh, that was such an album. I, we all loved that album. I, I really regret we didn't do enough as we didn't do as much as we should have. Yeah. And that came from somebody who, who was actually working it. Is it half empty the glass or half full? No, half full. Yes. Ha totally half full. Were it's you beating bubbling. yourself up at that time though? Uh, I, all, I still do. I think all of us do. Uh, creative pe most pe human beings, you compare yourself to other people. You, you, you're, you've got your yardstick looking at other people, how they're doing. Um, and, and thinking, oh, how come they're doing that? How come yeah. that's happening to them and it's not happening to me? But what I'm trying to do is focus on your own thing because people sometimes look at me and go, look, she's, look how well she's doing. Yeah. I think most of us are basically looking like swans in the top and underneath our feet are going... <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the world, it's norm horse. That's normal. Yeah. That's absolutely normal. But I just my whole adage is to try and treat people the way I would expect them to treat to teach me. Yeah, I, I wonder at the time. I mean, because I was so into music, and, and Billy Sloan and I, when we get oh, when we get together, we're like nonstop <laughs> trying to outdo each other in the in the knowledge. But <clears throat> at that period of time, and certainly prior to it as well, because of the friends and the circle that I had, you know, I would get you know music. Uh, a lot of gay music from Heaven, uh, tapes over yeah. from San Francisco, Bronski beat uh, were out, Jimmy Somerville was absolutely magnificent, I loved Giorgio Moroda, Donna Summer, all that type of stuff. I wonder, who were your influences because you don't, I mean, if everybody's <laughs> trying to put you into a box, you, I didn't, don't you didn't fit in that box. Who, no, who? well, I, I think I touched on that briefly in that my dad was listening to opera. Yeah. Um, and... Um, they would also conversely be on television. There'd be the Cilla Black special and, the, and Dusty Springfield. Um, I'm trying to think. There was I'm a glad whole, you mentioned that. That's a wee bit of the... Shirley Bassey. Yeah, you've got that unique, you, you know, it's great to you. You've got your own sound. That, well, I think this is, a, I think what's different these days about things is like, I've always just sung and tried to have the best voice, you know, make do things with my voice. I feel I'm a wee bit like... Um, uh, as a singer, I'm like workmanlike with it. it it's um, I'm not the best singer in the world, but I know what I'm doing with my voice and it's me. And it's an identity like a good wine that comes with time and life experience and all of these different things. You don't get these overnight. Yeah. But a lot of people, singers these days, they're listening to lots of other people and they're mannering themselves to other people. And there are less people who sound different Authentic. Authentic. Yeah. You know, and um, yeah, I despair a little bit. There, there is a, a sort of sound currently around that, that even some established singers I won't mention, um, they sound like they come from Carl. They do this thing with their voice and yeah. it goes the back of their throat. <laughs> and, and I'm like, what are they doing? It's like, oh, her. And the thing is, I've never, ever mannered myself to anyone else, never. Yeah. And that, so I just sound like me. In the early days, people go, oh, you know, horse, she sounds a bit like um, cross between Annie Lennox and Alison Moye. And I used to get annoyed. I used to get annoyed, not because they're not amazing singers, yeah. but, but I sound like me. I now understand that people have to try and find something to, com to, to explain. Yeah. You know, and, and I've met Alison Moye, and I have to say, I'd had a few drinks by this point, so had Alison Moye. <laughs> Years ago, I met her. And I went, do you know what I said? I'm fed up people comparing me to you. Yeah. What a stupid thing to say to her. <laughs> Unfortunately, when I met her, um, I, I, I was at an event in London a few years ago and I said, oh my God. I said, do you remember the time I kept, she went, no. And I went, thank God for that. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> but it was annoying. It, it, it's like saying, that comparing um, chalk and cheese. It's yeah. just, no. Well, no, that's another box they want to put you into. They want to try and categorise you to, to a group of people oh, you sound the, like this. It's the Scottish Joan I'm a trading. It's uh, yeah. Scottish Al, um, Alison Moye. But. See, the songs, I, I mean, we, we've talked about um, Speed of the Beat of My Heart, You Could Be Forgiven. I like uh, Sweet Thing. I think it's a great song. Um, I'm going to give you a wee thing, a bit of fun to go and look up, probably on YouTube. Um, uh, that was covered by Jennifer Rush. Ah, I was going to ask you about the covers. Is oh that my one God. No, I Good, knew that bad. She... <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Different. <laughs> Different, brilliant. <laughs> uh, produced by a Scots producer, actually, who was obviously working with her at the time. It's on an album called Cradle. 
But it's, it's great that someone covers your song. I'm not precious about that. It's just funny. It makes me laugh. Yeah. I've seen a couple, her on a couple of TV shows kind of lip syncing and you're like, whoa, that's yeah. a bit weird. Did you get a wedge for it? You, you get a little bit. Yeah, you <laughs> get, nothing major. It's not what, no, it's <laughs> more than you get from Spotify. Oh, sorry, did I say that? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, that's 0 0.004 pence per stream. So I've mentioned, though, uh, you know, I, Listen, I could mention every song and dissect them all, but we come to what I would call, and I don't want to in any way, uh, it's difficult for me to try and look and say this one's better than that one, but for the majority of your fans, Careful is an anthem. It's, it's such a special song. Tell me about its origins and how you are feeling to put something like that down. It's, I love I never tire of listening to that song. Yeah. Um... It's pretty much like I said before, it's it's the epitome of what a song is. It's a melody and a lyric. You can sunshine on your upturned face. You can just sing it. Uh, Careful with me. It's just it's just there. And it's one of those songs I've I've come to the conclusion that I'm very blessed. I feel very lucky and blessed. I feel that a lot of stuff, inspiration comes from somewhere else. I, and all I'm doing is sort of passing it on. And that song, um, it just was a magical process. And when we went to originally record it, the demo of it, the band played on it and I hated it. It sounded like um, a karaoke version yeah. or somebody covering the song. It just felt like everything you attached to it was not necessary. I'm glad you said that because I, I felt as maybe, I don't know if it was the record companies or who were trying to get it as a hit, started to fuck about with it. Yeah, I think that there's that element, you know, record companies are just, they're just this is what they do. You know, even something simple for the single cover. I had seen um, a beautiful illustration of a horse and it was, it was again, it was something symbolic about it. And it was owned by Richard Attenborough, the actor. And we had to get permission from Richard Attenborough to use this illustration that he owned by an artist called Brian Neal. And it's the outline of a horse. It's a sketch in blue. It's beautiful. And you can see the, the bones underneath it. And I thought, well, that's really perfect. You know, careful. It just seemed like, um, oh, that's forgiven. I'm talking about the... But anyway, that is a good example of what a record company do because um, while that was being prepared as a single, yeah. they, did, they got one of their artists to do a mock-up. And out there, there are the most horrific um, versions of that cover. I'll see if I can find them. It yeah. looks like somebody... Who couldn't draw? Yeah, it's like they, drawing it. Did they try to change the song as well? Because I've heard some, you know, kind of a beats added to it, and I'm yeah. thinking, oh, please don't no. do this to this song. This oh, is... there's. I've had a few, and I won't even mention who they are. But I've had a few people go, oh, this is amazing, horse. I'll go with this, and they actually put music that the, the no, music that doesn't notes that don't go. Yeah, and you're like, oh my god. And actually, I was doing a, I was doing a lecture on um, songwriting, and I said to him, here's the basic song. Here's the beautiful arrangement by Audrey Riley and myself singing. Um, and here is a dance mix by Sasha and Brothers in Rhythm. Um, and here's a mix by blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and I'm going, can you tell me what's wrong with this? And they're all going, it, it's just the, 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 mute, the, the, the key was all wrong. And, and it's like, what's going yeah, on? So, square so peg in a round hole. Yeah, so the basic song is a melody and a lyric. And that's why Careful works. There's also um, singing the song in the studio. It was the last song I had to sing and there was a fight going on between <laughs> the producer and the engineers, um, Sven and Carl, funnily enough. Um, he came in. I wasn't hearing what I needed in my cans. It had changed. He'd gone out. The producer came back in and I said, he said, what's wrong? And I was like, well, I said, the, the mix has changed a little bit. And, <laughs> and so this is funny, actually. The studio, this massive studio, and massive, it's utopia, like massive window. And the desk's up there, and, and you're behind, like, these little um, uh, barriers with windows and a carpet and a huge hallway. And I see him, it's like a silent movie, I see him going, <laughs> and door banging, and then I see him, his hands around Sven's neck, <laughs> like this. And then he marches into me, grabs a set of headphones and he's standing beside me and I've got to sing that last note. Wow. <laughs> and if you listen to it very carefully, it's like I'm going, ee, and my, my, beat, my heart beats <laughs> and it goes, the note dips 
and then it, it resolves a bit like um, a ballet dancer going whoosh, like this at the end, so it's fine. So there was a lot going on um, for me. It's the end of the album. I'd lost my voice. I'd had to have an operation, remove a, a node from my vocal cord. Couldn't sing for two months. So in, within me singing, there's this kind of release of all sorts of things. So I think it's all contained in it. Um, and, and that's what I think sometimes I can do that maybe some people can't. I, I let a little bit of myself out into it. Yeah. That song um, is ever so poignant for yourself because you mentioned you've lost your mum and dad, but mm. when I read that um, mm. your best audience, I think, ever, uh -huh. uh, nobody has to pay. No. Um, it's the saddest situation ever for, mm. you, for you singing that song to your mum. Mm -hmm. I felt in some sort of respects it was a little bit like giving her something back for for being there for me, silently yeah. being there for me. I have solely. to add, this is your, your mum's passing away. Yeah, before she died, yep. Um, at a little cottage hospital in Lanark. Um, and we were all in the room. And, and so basically we had a sort of communion with the minister and I'd said to my brothers, I, I, I want to, to sing to her. And they just go, how are you going to do that? And I said, I don't know, I just will. And um, so, so I looked at her. She couldn't talk. Um, she had ovarian cancer. She couldn't talk, um, but she she was smiling at me. Yeah. But it felt like me all those times of her creeping up that back staircase. <laughs> I just had this this feeling of wanting to give her something. And um, I, I I've written a song since called Heaven Can Wait. And you you so I'm almost like, um, you brought me into this world, and I watch as you leave mine. You know, and um, it was that enormity, that, that moment that a, a lot of us will go through and can't explain to anyone else, but it was something I wanted to do for her. So I sang it and she smiled. She smiled at me. She couldn't speak, but she was smiling. And I knew that that was, I, I felt that was my gift um, and I was passing it on to her. Better than any applause. Yeah, I've sung it to a few other people um, as well in that s same situation. I, I've had... Um, a few fans, you know, that, that have been special. There was an older couple. Um, I went to their wedding and um, sang for them. And a friend of a friend said that um, um, uh, she was passing away. And I was like, oh, my God. I, I said, there's nothing I can do. And they were like, no, no, that, there's nothing. I said, maybe I can sing. And um, so I phoned and... I didn't know what to say, but I found that incredibly moving because this woman was older and it reminded me of my mum and I um, I sang to her and I just heard the phone click. Wow. And that was it. And things I don't do it for everybody and it's not something I go, hey, that's a lot of money, you'll need to pay me this. Yeah. It's because it feels the right thing to do. But it just shows you that um, when I, my world has been about um, my voice for me and now I'm sharing it yeah and with that in mind there will be a 30th anniversary tour which would have taken place exactly at the right time had it not been for the <laughs> yeah. madness of covid um how do you feel now going out 30 years on and you're going to sing this whole thing what is what is horse now as you <laughs> glide onto that stage well from a practical level standing on a stage for two hours you know <laughs> i'm going to I, well i started a bit of training and then it fell by the wayside over covid but yeah the the audience reaction we've done one show and then it all stopped and the audience reaction was just absolutely incredible so you've got the album in order and then you're like what do you do now so we, we've then got a sort of section of the most popular things. And then there's a cover. There's a cover that no one is expecting. Wow. So that's a good surprise. Which, which goes into Careful with a band version of Careful. So um, it's, it, honestly, if, it's a wonderful show. I love it myself. I yeah. really, really enjoyed it. It, it, it. It's never, it's not like a revisit because I've never not been doing it. Yeah. But um, the, the occasion is the special thing because what the reason I'm still doing this, I do it for myself, but I also do it for people like you who the album is so important and, and it bucks all the trends um, and, and the lack of support from different sort of institutions or, you know, media or whatever. Um, I'm doing it for those people and I get very annoyed when people miss me or the album out of lists because you're dissing those people. 
and their tastes. Yeah, and with that in mind, um, what is horse the person like? Because uh, I all horrible. She's <laughs> well, it, uh, the funny thing is, you know, your pals will know you. We don't. We can. We can only scratch the surface of uh -huh. what you like. But uh, I always say to people, you know, if you've gone on that journey and you're looking back over thirty years, you know, it's, it's the I always say the George Benson moment. You've got it. It's the greatest love of all. You've got to love yourself, yeah. and then. Yeah. People come along with you. Are you a more confident person? Is the person that you wanted to be and be accepted for then striding out onto that stage? Or do you still have little insecurities in the background? I think the person that people saw, you know, 30 years ago was um, in their own box. A box I created to protect myself. Um, and now this person is out the box. And the image that people saw was quite androgynous, quite hard. But that's not me. It's not me at all. And and I think over the years I've been able to un, just reveal myself and let myself go a little bit. So uh, people talk about you're on a stage, you're not. That's not the real person. And you know you go home and you're the real person. I actually now know that the person on the stage is me, is the real person, and yeah. I'm giving and and loving and caring what people think. And that's amazing. Yeah. I mean, a couple of points before we go. Oh, yeah. I, I, I want to pull this up here. Obviously, yeah. you're lucky because um, <laughs> I, this was actually at the point where CDs were becoming ever so popular. So oh, that... this is, yeah. Have I changed? Uh, well, to be fair, by the way, uh, what kind of adulation were you getting then? Because, you know, I, I still thought you were... I, I, I thought you were cool as ice then. <laughs> the way they portrayed you in the... And the videos were, you know, I thought, uh, you Did know. Did you really? Yeah, did you uh, think it was quite, yeah. Yeah, I thought you were cool. It was the 80s. Yeah, I think you can see in that photograph, I think this is a photograph by, I think it's Andy Catlin. Do you like it? I'm very sad. I look very sad in that photograph, I think. Right. It's, 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 I'm looking out at people kind of going, you know, um, I'm just like you. You know, there's something about that is, yeah. is um, like that. And... Stylo Rouge, eh, Rob, the guy that did this, this is the first time computer graphics were happening. Ah, right. And I, I met him fairly recently, and he's going, oh, my God. He said, that was when we were just, he said, I didn't know what the heck I was doing. Was tinkering with it. You know, but there is something very kind of iconic about taking that strong image. I mean, you could have, a, I had a photograph or something like that, but also it was decided just to have me rather than the whole band. Right. Um, and that has always been, I think, a difficult thing, say, for Angela, you know, because she was always, not second fiddle, but always not part of the kind of main um, thrust. But it, I think it's to do with the voice. Yeah. I think that's what happens. Was there, a, was there a sense, was there even from your own point of view, because it's 30 years on, were you tempted to say to Angela, look, come out of retirement, come on and do it? I did ask her to come. Um, yeah. She came to see uh, the, the 25th of the... Um, uh, God's Home movie. She came to the concert hall. I said, oh, why didn't you come? She went, no, no, I don't... No, no. Because she's, she's a gestalt therapist now, she's a counsellor, she probably doesn't think that way, but I was looking for this. Yeah, so the, the logo is um, a seahorse. Yeah. Because that was the other thing that people kept thinking, you know, um, the seahorse, horse, the word horse. Um, well, you know in the play, the, the word horse, it, it just came out of a strange thing of me liking horses. Yeah. Um, and not wanting to be called what I was uh, christened. Um, and... It just became this thing of horse, but people thought of the animal. Whereas we thought that this, this seahorse imagery was more powerful because this was a an unusual sea creature, yeah. which was a little bit less than the four-legged biped with big teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Quadruped with big teeth. And, and a couple of things before we yeah. finish, horse. Um, that 30 years ago. Oh, oh you've, <laughs> moved, you've moved on in the world. You're in the National Portrait Gallery. Yes, I say, I've yeah. acquired for the nation. <laughs> Yes, that even that is for me. That's I, I went. I, I've sent Roxana the artist. I went to the gallery and got this and put the boat stamp there so that she still had that. But she approached me at a gig um, several years ago now, yeah. and uh, it was really weird. It was almost like you know that come up and see my etchings. <laughs> she said, "Do you want to come up and see my paintings?" And I thought, "Oh, be careful here." <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I, my background is art, yeah. and um, she. Uh, <clears throat> she said, do you want to come up? And so I, I, I said, not now, I'll come at another point. So it took a period of time for me to get to her studio. Right. She's got an incredible studio in an old cinema in, in Streatham in London. And um, it's just full of uh, theatre costumes, mannequins, all her paintings. And she's in what's literally called the Bavarian Buffet. 
So when you went to the theatre or the cinema, you go up to the Bavarian buffet and it's got yeah. flock wallpaper and it's still got the old sort of German uh, bath tools, whatever. But anyway, yeah. she said, well, can I do your portrait? Has anyone done your portrait before? And I was like, sure, yeah. I didn't think, of, at that point, I didn't think about the end point. I just thought, yeah, that'd be nice. Yeah, yeah. next time I come down, fine. Went down, and it's a year ago yesterday when I, po I went down for po uh, posing, not a year ago, two years ago. Yeah. And uh, I, I just literally went in and she said, so what do you, and I was like, no, I'm going to have to sing because I want to sing and be natural. Yes. So I sang careful, I don't know how many times. Right. And this is an amalgamation of my hand movements. Right. And you've seen me sing. And you've got a copy of it? I've got a print of it in yeah. my house, but but so it, it it a long journey forward. Imogen Gibbon, the curator from the Scottish National Portrait Gallery, liked Roxana Hall's work, had seen an exhibition, said, "Can I come and see your? Can I come up and see your etchings?" Yeah. So she went to the the studio and um, she said, oh, "Oh, Roxana, I really love your work. I'd love us to have some of your work in Scottish galleries, um, but it would obviously have to have a Scottish um, subject." And yeah. she went, "Oh, I'm I'm painting Horse McDonald." She went. <gasps> I must see it. So unbeknownst to me, um, she saw the portrait before I did. Yeah. And um, when it was getting to the point where, it, so to cut a very long story short, um, it's a very serious business when our money is being used, the yeah. government money is being used to acquire something for the nation. So it goes through an entire process of people saying yes, yes or no. Wow. And it took months and it went different galleries around Scotland to make the decision. Came to the final point, and that's when she phoned me and she said, look, um, just to let you know. I was like, oh, right, okay, when's the final meeting? And uh, it was then, the, we want to acquire it. It had its own box built for it. Somebody wow. came down in a big vehicle, <laughs> air conditioned or whatever. They, they actually um, built this box, put it in. Um, the woman that came down um, was a big fan, so she was thrilled to bits with the whole process. Came up to Scotland, and it's been, up until a couple of days ago, it's been hanging in the Great Hall. So you actually walk into the gallery, or you walked into the gallery, and there it was there. Wow. Very special, very bright. Yeah. An eye popping. And uh, it's just literally moved up to the modern art section. Ah, and I've I love got Kirsty Wark on one side, <laughs> and I've got who's the, another artist on the other side. Right. So it's now, a thrill of a lifetime, this. Absolutely, you should feel proud, uh, very proud of it. Before we finish, I'm going to hit you with something out of left field that you're going to have to think about on your feet. More left field? <laughs> no, just this is, this is the, you're going to have to think quickly. It's, it's an unusual request. But um, before that, if you said at the start of this interview, same sky was, you, you know when you're hitting the top end of it. Um, I equally became frustrated because I thought God's Home movie and the songs on that were, you know, can I say they were better? I could see you evolving Debate, and growing. Yeah. Um, mm. So I wanted that to be the thing that took you on to the next level, um, just as I did with many other Scottish artists, but because I'd been on that journey thinking, I love this artist. Did you feel the same way? Was there a chance? Was this you going downwards with that album? Or was this you, you felt on a level that they, they weren't getting you anywhere, you were flatlining? I think there are so many things going on towards the making of an album. That the, the, there's the personnel, there's the label you're dealing with. There's a journey from leaving one label, moving to another label. It's years yeah. and years and years. And it's actually we were we had used one producer who was I can't even say too much about him. But anyway, he used seventy five percent of our budget on one or two tracks. Wow. So we ended up having to do a lot of the work ourselves to pull that together. But a lot of people probably won't see the joints because if you get it mixed properly, it, it works out very well. Um, yeah, it, it's frustrating. And then after that, I mean, after years of getting to have record deals, etc., um, you know, and then stopping working with Angela, the band sort of doing other things because God's Home Movie was a different version of people, different yeah. group of people rather. Um, and so at that point, um, after finishing God's Home Movie, doing what we had to do with that and it falling away, it's a, it's a hard boulder to carry up a hill, it really is. Yeah. Um, especially if it's thought, a shared one. Did you, do you love that just as much, that album? Yes, very much so. But, do you know, it's so hard. It's like, um, people say, what's your favourite song or favourite album? 
they're all like your children. Yeah, I know, I know. It's you, it, it's hard to choose any individual song, but if I move on since then, I have there's a handful of songs which I think are, you know, stunning songs. There's a song called Ghost I wrote with Gordon Turner, which is off the last album, Home. From this album, there is another careful. I'm almost sure of it. It's called The Moon and I. And um, that's, we just finished that. And it's just me. It's me, a tiny bit of piano and a tiny bit of cello. And it's it's me singing very closely into a mic. And it's it, I find it hard and cringy because it's so exposed. Yeah. But there's something very special about it. Well, listen, I, I've enjoyed this. It's gone for hours. It, it, it's <laughs> well, like, as you can tell, I can't shut up. So well, no, you know, it's I mean, been lovely talking to you. Listen, it's a labour of love. Um, this was an easy one to sit down um, and talk about something that I absolutely love and adore from yourself um, as a talented artist. Um, and I love the fact that you've been a pioneer um, for things. You know, I, I, I think the empathy I have with it is I always think to myself when people talk about being put in boxes, I thought, try being a Catholic in the West of Scotland. <laughs> uh, and then you, you get other things. That, it doesn't matter what it is, that you're always going to be uh, boxed or discriminated against. But I, I just, I thought you fought the, the, the fight and also let your talent do the talking as well. So before we finish, and just quick fire. Well, I was just going to say to you that I don't think the fight's over because be a woman, be a lesbian, um, <laughs> you know, there was those difficult things, yeah. Scottish within a global music industry. Um, now the other thing that's been added to the pot is age. And here uh, I am, I just uh, turned 63 years old. Wow. 63 years old and I'm about to do a national tour. And um, what I want, if nothing else, is for people to listen to the music, listen to the voice, and if you like it, share it. That's that's you know, because that's really important. Because you don't you don't stop being creative at, at forty or fifty or sixty. Yeah. Well, listen. I hope people will revel in the nostalgia of the same sky, and then I hope equally so they'll get as excited as you've given us a little incentive. <laughs> so here's the quick fire questions to yeah, finish. Sorry, if I, if I could talk forever, Peter. Okay. <laughs> if you'd one song that you wish you'd written from any artist. Um. First time ever I saw your face. That's a good one. Beautiful. You're now on a, des a desert island. I hate to kind of steal the theme of it, but I'm only giving you five albums to take with you that must have the same criteria that I brought you into the studio with. There's not a duff song on it. Mm. Oh, God, that's hard. I wish I'd thought of this before <laughs> they came in. Um, You'll drive uh, away thinking I wish I'd mentioned that one. Um, Can you hit five songs instead then? Uh, right, so the songs of influence, uh, La Belle, Lady Marmalade. Yep. Not the other shit versions. Yes. Um, the first time ever I saw your face, the version by, um, God, her name's going to... Roberta make, Flack. Roberta Flack's version. It's the most beautiful thing. Um, oh. uh, Joan Armour Trading, Love and Affection. Yep. That's three, isn't it, right? Yeah, uh, and, uh, and all fairly ballady, you know. Yeah, well, part of Lady Marmalade. Yeah, it's upbeat, yeah. Yeah, um, gosh. Uh, Sparks, uh, Never Turn Your Back in Mother Earth. Um, maybe, um, maybe, uh, Metal Guru, T-Rex. Right, and if there's one concert that I give you two tickets for of somebody you wish you'd seen? It could be anybody, of course, couldn't it? Dead yeah. or Alive? Oh, I don't know. One of the ones I wanted to go and see was Lauren Iroh. Right. Or she could pronounce her name Nero, I think. A great um, New Yorker uh, songwriter. Uh, that's maybe, yeah, maybe. Yeah. I'll maybe come back and go, oh no, I should have chosen that person. <laughs> There's no point in informing me, it's on I've film. I've seen Bowie, <laughs> I've seen uh, various other artists I wanted to see. I went and saw um, uh, Tony Bennett. He wasn't at his best, but I saw Tony Bennett. Right. They say you should never meet your your heroes. I met um, I met Ken Gleeson, I wasn't disappointed. I like him, he's funny, <laughs> he's got a dry sense of humour. Um, pop heroes, um, I met you today, uh, as I have on several occasions. I met Jim Kerr, and I love him. Um, he's a great lad. Uh, is there anybody you've met that was a hero of yours in the industry and you thought, ah, even better than... Cindy Lauper. Yeah? Cindy Lauper, absolutely incredible person, incredible human being, absolutely amazing. Um, I had, when I was having my operation, my vocal cords, somebody gave me one of her albums, um, and I've just admired her as a person because she does so much for charity. Um, as well as seeing her live, 
She's just an incredible performer. Not recognised as a singer, but she's a great singer. But I met her backstage uh, last time she was on tour, and I went in, and and uh, she's a real no, he's talks like that, you know, and yeah. and and I was. She eventually came out. She'd gone to cool her voice down, and I said, I, "I'm just so excited to meet you because I think you're an amazing singer." What what do, routines do you use? So she told me about um, how she um, steams her voice, warms her voice up, and then off she'll go out. She'll come back, she'll steam her voice and warm down. And she wrote she wrote her number of her um, voice coach. And I oh. thought, yes, Cindy, I'm going to fly to New York <laughs> and I'm going to pay that amount of money for your coach. But she, that was, a, and there's a photograph of me, I'm like, <laughs> Brilliant. Like that. Don't worry about that. I'm going to get one of them at the end of this LinkedIn interview. <laughs> um, okay, listen, horse, it's been an absolute delight. I I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I don't care what age you are, um, get the same sky. Even if you discover it in the 21st century, it's well worthy of spending an hour and a half of enjoyment uh, listening to that. If you get the chance, go to the concert. Um, and I can't wait for the new stuff. Horse, thanks for coming in. My pleasure. Come to the tour. I'm, I'm on tour throughout the UK um, from February the 5th. <laughs>